Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Build for Trust podcast. Uh, I'm Nick Lippis. Um, we're actually going to dive into 5G and private 5G in particular on this podcast. Uh, we have the uh, Open Innovation Lab, the 5G Open Innovation Lab, and we have Jim. And Jim, why don't you pronounce your last name so I don't embarrass myself? <laughs> no worries. <laughs> uh, it's Jim Brisbane. And thank you, Nick and Stephen, for inviting me on to today's podcast. Excellent. Great, Jim. Um, welcome. Uh, and Steve Collins, you know, Steve Collins, like the ONUC CTO. Steve, say a quick hi. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And uh, thanks, Nick. I'm excited to be on your uh, your your podcast for the first time. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to have you. And, you know, we've just been spending a lot of time on 5G and, and private 5G in particular and all the iterations associated with it. We had, I think, a really good uh, meeting in fall um, uh, in New York City uh, around private 5G. Um, we had a very we had a dedicated track, and so we're planning the same thing for this year. But I think you know, let's let's dive into this because I think you know, the more that we kind of um, have gone into it, I'm almost thinking the less excited I'm getting. And so um, let's um, let's kind of explore that. I know we have a whole bunch of kind of questions, you know, here. So. Um, Steve, why don't you start off? Yeah, yeah. So, Jim, you know, I know you guys at the 5G Innovation Lab are all about 5G in the enterprise market. And, um, you know, if you think back to, let's just say, I don't know, five years ago, um, there was a lot of hype about 5G. Um, you know, you fast forward to where we are today, it's largely a consumer market phenomenon. Um, you know, and I think in the enterprise market, it really hasn't kind of lived up to the hype, you know, certainly not yet. So, just wanted to get your thoughts on the current state of the market for enterprise 5G. Yeah, I mean, there's lots to unpack there. Um, the, the need for enterprise connectivity is strong. That's for certain. The solutions that are in market, uh, you know, kind of vary. Uh, we have great partnerships with Ericsson and Nokia as an example, and they've taken a lot of their you know, strong heritage and technology in the larger macro networks and are, are bringing, you know, managed solutions into into the enterprise. And uh, they've had various degrees of success in that. Um, we've been very fortunate to work with six different startups that are building private 5G uh, platforms as well, Expedo, GXC, Kubucor, FireCell, FreedomFi, um, Ataya. So their list goes on. Um, there's companies that we've worked with like Ataya that are saying, look, 5G is in the enterprise is not just about 5G. It's actually a convergence of different networks. And so we're starting to see their capabilities in both cellular, Wi-Fi, even LoRaWAN, all as a sort of singular platform. Um, so the need for connectivity in the enterprise uh, is strong. There's no question in my mind about that. We just um, finished building a, a private network that will support five enterprises uh, here in the Pacific Northwest at the port of uh, Tacoma. And their needs for coverage across the yard, uh, for tracking trailers, uh, for providing connectivity to their workers, for worker safety, and for other things just cannot be addressed with current Wi-Fi capabilities. Wi-Fi is great in, in a lot of scenarios, but when it comes to broad coverage, it just doesn't have you know, the reach, nor is it cost effective to deploy multiple access points. Uh, to support connectivity. And, you know, they've seen that play out. And we've seen this happen in the ecosystem, you know, at large. So I definitely see that there is a market. I think where the underwhelming has come in, and this is really just my perspective uh, on the, you know, the rather limited insights that I've had in talking to a number of enterprises. Um, I think there's what I call an impedance mismatch. Um, in many cases, um, you know, cellular connectivity and cellular networking is is far more complex than Wi-Fi. Uh, I think Wi-Fi is tried and tested. It's relatively turnkey for the most part in the enterprise. And the mindset that enterprises have is that cellular is kind of the same way. It's just bigger radios, let's say, or uh, we're using license or unlicensed spectrum in another area that they're not familiar with. Um, from a supplier standpoint, you're kind of bringing <clears throat> network capabilities that are initially targeted to the big CSPs, uh, you know, the Verizon's, AT&T's, T-Mobile's here in the United States that serve hundreds of millions of uh, subscribers. Um, that level of technology and network coverage is, is far, far bigger than what an enterprise needs. And with that comes some complexity, obviously, and in some cases, um, some cost as well. So in the conversations that I've had with enterprises, the, the need for connectivity 
in certain use cases like outdoor coverage or even indoor for manufacturing and logistics and distribution, that's strong. And the limits of Wi-Fi have been met. And so they are they are looking at alternatives. But when they look at the alternatives, in some cases, the implementation of the cellular networks are just too too complex. And then the price points, in some cases, the price points are just too too far ahead. And so there's this um, reluctance to kind of push forward on that because in many cases, carriers don't want to, or sorry, enterprises don't want to sign up for what could be a three hundred to five hundred thousand dollar network for one or two access points, right? And in their mind, the complexity and the costs really don't pan out all that much. What we have seen at the Port of Tacoma as a more immediate example is when you provide that connectivity and you start solving some of these easier use case issues that they have. There's a thirst to do more. Uh, many of these uh, enterprises that we've worked with now really want to go deeper on that. So. Um, I, I guess I would say that private cellular networking is very much here to stay. There's a convergence happening in the marketplace. Price points around these solutions will eventually drop. Uh, and the simplicity of rolling these things out and then managing them as part of an IT stack uh, will will play out as well. And that's where I believe that um, cellular coverage in, um, or cellular networking rather, in enterprises is almost a foregone conclusion. It, it's it's happening uh, for certain. Yes, yeah, you know, I, 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 I think... I, I, Sorry, Nick. I, I was going to say I agree with you there, Jim. I was actually where I was heading with just my opening remarks was I was really referring to kind of the GSMA's vision of self-driving cars and smart cities and, you know, yeah. enterprise 5G kind of in the wild, you know, enabling a whole set of futuristic use cases. And, um, you know, that's where I kind of feel like, you know, we, we're really a long ways away from kind of living up to that hype. And I think you yeah. rightly pointed out that, the bright spot is you can take this 5G technology and deploy it in an enterprise network inside the premise, you know, on site and, right. and deliver real business value. Sorry, Nick. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think this is where my mind is going is that um, the 5G in the uh, enterprise marketplace is very unique, meaning outdoor spaces, stadiums. Uh, particular manufacturing facilities that have a real latency, strict latency kind of requirement. Um, and I'm not sure how big that market is, um, but I don't see a lot of the startups killing it. Um, and so there's, I think there is, this industry has not been able to provide a general purpose solution. I think that's probably it, you know, like, like Wi-Fi is general purpose. It has its limitations for sure. We all know that, but there's a ton of money and a ton of companies that are, um, that are in that marketplace that are constantly competing and trying to innovate to close those gaps um, where we don't see the same in the 5G space. The 5G space, it has like a lot of, you know, conditions that, that are, that are different because it's both public, you know, and also private. Like what, how much was there like a hundred billion dollars or so spent on spectrum across AT&T, Verizon and T-Mobile. It's a long time to recover that, you know, um, that money. And I think the consumer side of that um, is kind of reluctant to increase their spend, you know, on, you know, um, on their uh, cellular services to make that recovery, you know, quicker. And in the large enterprise, I think, Jim, you alluded to it, and I agree with it, is the complexity of that. And I think, you know, uh, maybe there is a play um, where it's, okay, it's Wi-Fi, it's 5G, it's, you know, all the other kind of, of flavors and variations, you know, of, um, you know, of kind of cellular. But I think like right now, I'm, what I'm seeing and is a kind of a lack of a general purpose solution. And I think there's there's some there's a couple of companies that are kind of in the works that are kind of thinking of this in terms of like cloud mobile, you know. So it's like it's provide a kind of a a a mobile service that is cloud based and cloud delivered, um, but it's also it's hybrid. So it's both private, uh, meaning that the dashboards and the control systems that you provide to IT are familiar to IT people not to the service providers. So the <laughs> control is in the, um, is in the domain of the IT and the kind of the networking departments. Um, and then, uh, and trying to mask a lot of the complexity 
with all the various different flavors of, of cellular. So, and so I think kind of the whole, there's a cloud mobile beginning of a cloud mobile movement. I think that that's starting to happen, you know, here where 5G is one part of that. And then AI actually plays a role in here um, around uh, maybe a much more efficient and better way to do uh, spectrum allocation and load balancing. And if you're doing splicing, splicing, you know, as well. So I think it's like, it, to me, it's like the innovation spark here is really around kind of cloud cloud delivery, not cloud providers, you know, but cloud delivery mechanisms. Um, it's AI around the lifecycle management, the orchestration, you know, of it, you know, a cleaner, clean dashboard. Um, I think that's it. And I'm not sure where the open RAN, like the open RAN stuff should be promising for the enterprise because that really kind of drastically reduces uh, the barrier of entry. Um, but again, in there, you know, really haven't seen like a big uptake, you know, in the large enterprise marketplace that, yeah, you can point to like baseball stadiums, football stadiums, uh, various different hospitals and so forth. But I think those are very, you know, they're unique industry sectors and they're not the broad general marketplace. That's, that's what I'm some of those scenarios. Saying, Jim, you, yeah. When you, when you reference like stadiums, um, some people are confusing DAS with 5g or, private 5G. And so when you get into those discussions, you really got to parse out what is DAS and what is truly private cellular. Um, but Nick, you, you hit on something that's really interesting. Going back to my impedance mismatch point that I made earlier, mm -hmm. when I worked at uh, uh, PeopleSoft and then Oracle, I joined Oracle after PeopleSoft acquired, or sorry, Oracle acquired PeopleSoft. And they took these enterprise ERP platforms in finance and HR and supply chain and CRM, they slapped an SMB title on it, reduced some functionality and said, this is good enough for SMB. That's essentially what's kind of happening in this world. So there's two forces in the marketplace from a solution standpoint. There are up and comers, and I mentioned a few of those, which we've worked with, Expedo, GXC, Ataya, Freedom Fire, Fire Cell, Monogoto. Um, and so they're coming in from that sort of angle. They have no legacy, really. They're just building net new. And then you have the incumbents who have great, deep enterprise, uh, sorry, uh, networking experience. And they're trying to take some of that goodness and bundle it up and make it ready for the enterprise. What we have seen in hands-on POC engagements with enterprises is they treat this in their mindset very similar to Wi-Fi. And so to your point, Nick, they want to manage this like Wi-Fi. There's an impedance mismatch. Mm. The other thing is, yeah. let's say you have a successful private 5G POC and a client wants to move forward. In fact, we're working with one uh, today that wants to move forward. There's a limited a number of devices that you can actually use. Why? Because there isn't that big of a market. And so we have this sort of like hesitation in the market. It's not quite really exploded. Uh, for, from my standpoint, yeah. the cloud hosted piece is, is being done. I think Solona is a great example of that. Bicel has done uh, cloud hosted cores. And so really you just send access points. You have someone integrate them into the core, provision the SIMs. And I'm simplifying all of this, obviously, but you're kind of off and running. But in the in the POC that we've been involved with just recently, that was one of the requirements. The client said, "This is great. I, I've got my scanners are connected. My I have no more dead zones. My employees are much more productive. Now I need to manage all this. So plug it into my IT system." Uh, and mm. and that's reality. That's what's gonna. Yeah. That's what's uh, really gonna happen. So, yeah. Like I, I said, I don't I don't see private five G going away in the enterprise. It's it's a must. It's gonna happen. There's just some work that has to happen in the product and. Um, and solution area that's that that will make that Nick to your point appropriate for the enterprise to really get into more of a general purpose play. Yeah, On yeah the you know, I, side, I I definitely think ORAN is going to play a huge role in enterprise because they don't really have any religion around ORAN versus non ORAN. What they uh, care about is security, uh, cost, and TCO, obviously, and then simplicity. And uh, I think in all those areas, when ORAN hits those marks, I think you'll start to see much more broader adoption of it. In the solutions that we've been involved in, we deploy ORAN by way of Airspan. And we use an Expedo core in some cases, or a Druid core, or a GXC, or whomever that we've worked with in our startups. And so we're fully in on the ORAN camp just because it's, it's accessible, accessible rather, and it's relatively cost effective. And from a configuration standpoint, once you know your, your way around the platform, it's, it's quite easy to pull together and, and have it stable. Yeah, yeah. I, think I was going to say there's a there's a chicken and egg problem here too, right? So I think, totally. um, you know, if you're a new vendor, right? So, so a lot of startups are in this space, right? They need some level of critical mass to start, you know, 
getting an accessible market they can sell their products to to generate the revenue and they need to continue to be successful and um, at the same token the enterprises are kind of waiting for the market to mature so that they can adopt the technology so it's like anything you just got to get the kind of the the snowball rolling here um, and then you know the market starts to build itself over time and i think we're really seeing that in the private 5g space i i have got full yeah. confidence that private 5g is on a really good path to success yeah what i you know was referring to up front though is on the enterprise 5g and when i say that i mean out into the macro network you know and just being able to use 5g as kind of another mode of connectivity for for enterprise use cases you know outside of the the enterprise domain um you know we're waiting for the 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 5g network operators to upgrade their cores to 5g standalone and at, at, when we get to 5g standalone is when we really get a full-fledged 5g network that can support all the kind of futuristic use cases that folks have talked about not just high bandwidth or high throughput but low latency ultra high reliability there's a whole set of requirements that kind of get built into those use cases and we're just not there yet it's just a big lift for the operators to get from where they are today with lte cores to to moving to a, a 5g uh, native core yeah absolutely uh, you know this this kind of like reminds me of um I have two thoughts, you know, first of all, I think, I think this industry is somewhat of an echo chamber, you know, uh, meaning that, you know, they all focus on those particular um, industry verticals um, where they either want to do market creation, market, try to like create market adoption. They're seeing some requirements that aren't being addressed by, um, by existing technologies. And so, and I think that they all, they don't have a lot of input from the consumer, <laughs> let's put it that way. You know, it's like a, maybe in those particular areas. So I think they tend to kind of talk to themselves without really taking in the voice and the concerns and the use case and the requirements of a broader general enterprise marketplace. I think, you know, that, that's what it seems like, you know, to me. And yeah, if you're um, referring to the 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 industry by way of like the the network equipment providers and the CSPs going into an enterprise discussion, you're you're yeah. absolutely correct. Uh, yeah. Uh, again, small sample size. When I've been involved in enterprise conversations where I'd led with the use case and the network is secondary, almost always it's winning, almost always, mm -hmm. because the use case is what's driving the client on the pain point that they have. So so specifically that they'll buy that use case and the network just becomes part of it. Yeah. Um, when you walk in with a networking conversation, it's kind of like, hey, you run a Ferrari? It's like, I don't know if I need a Ferrari. My Pinto seems to be working really well. But if you walk into the conversation saying, I know that's that a big gap. That. I know. I, I I've owned both of those cars. <laughs> I've owned a Pinto and I've owned a Ferrari. That's a big I saw gap. A Pinto in, in suits yesterday. It's, it's still stuck in my mind. Um, anyhow, but when you when you walk in with that networking level conversation, it's a harder sell because of the complexity and the cost and everything else. But I I've been in conversations with enterprises where when you solve that real problem, it's kind of like the cloud. And this is where I, I kind of get frustrated with the CSP world. But you don't have to yeah. learn net new lessons. The lessons have been learned in the cloud era, right? When yeah. we were at Microsoft and I was there for almost 14 years, when we led with a cloud conversation, it was a bit of a harder uphill challenge because in many cases, many of these enterprises have virtualized their workloads and they're quite happy running on a virtualized platform in their own data centers and so on and so forth. So we had to shift more to a solutions discussion where we brought more advanced capabilities that were easier to spin up in the cloud than it was to run in-house. And that's how we at Microsoft eventually got the enterprise more and more into the cloud over time. You led with solution conversations and the cloud just kind of came with the solution. It's a much easier discussion longer term. And so when a traditional ecosystem player in the CSP world, whether you're a network provider or a CSP or you know someone in that world walks in with a networking level conversation, it's kind of like I don't have a problem or an acute enough problem to go solve that problem just yet. And then the other big question is, what do I do with this network when I have it? But when you walk in with a, yeah. hey, I can go help you solve that problem that's costing you 100 grand a year every year. And, and here's the solution. And by the way, with that comes with this network. And when you have this network, there's so many other things you can do with it. That's when the lights go on. And it's a much easier conversation to have. So we almost never really lead with a networking discussion. We always lead with how can we solve uh, any particular problem when we use the the alumni that we've worked with as a way to go solve those problems, including our partners. And that's almost a win almost every time. 
uh, with the yeah. solution. Well, then you're selling to a different audience, right? So yeah. you're selling um, to a uh, either a business manager or someone within the business that has a problem that maybe isn't being addressed. But I think what happens like in, in the networking industry, which is a little bit different than uh, in enterprise software, is that at the end of the day, it's the networking folks are going to say yes or no. You know, they're either going to be heads going up and down or they're going back and forth. And, and I think they'll look at it from a life cycle management kind of point of view. And, um, and they might, if they're not comfortable with it, you know, and it, they don't kind of see a path, you know, for it, then, um, then I think, you know, that, that top down approach, which makes a lot of sense, Jim, there's no doubt about that. Um, but that pop, top down approach will find resistance. You know, um, if the networking teams are not part of that process, they're not just going to oh, like absolutely. say, "Okay, great, we'll do this." You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah absolutely. I wanted to. I actually wanted yeah. to make a comment about that because there's obviously keen focus on, let's say, a half a dozen industry verticals for for private five G, right? And you've got a all the leading vendors from the the biggest players right down to the the newest startups are keenly focused on transportation, shipping ports, airports, um, you know, warehouses, uh, factory floors, you know, the, the kind of the usual suspects, right? And, um, and I think that's great. And that's a great way to get the market started. But, you know, as Nick points out, if the technology is really going to be adopted kind of by mainstream, you know, corporate enterprises, um, you know, there has to be an effort to bring those folks along. Because as Nick said, you know, they're not just going to take whatever comes in with that kind of vertical solution. Uh, because, you know, the analogy I use is there's in a, a, like a Mount Everest of technical debt out there that has been brought into IT environments, you know, kind of under the guise of, you know, here's a solution that solves a business problem, but it dragged in all kinds of technology that, you know, either didn't work or became obsolete or was just really non-optimal in the long run. And that's what the, enterprise at work networking people are getting pretty good at kind of sussing out in advance, right? They can look at something and go, yeah, that's got legs. That'll fly. We can, you know, we can put that in and run that in the network for the next five years versus, I don't know, that looks a little shaky. Not so sure about that company, you know, or their technology. So there's an element of, you know, market development here, I think, um, amongst those who play in the 5G community to kind of bring those enterprise networkers along. Um, yeah. and, and don't just assume, hey, I got the, you know, I've got the use case, so therefore this is all going to happen. In fact, I'd argue that may be an, an impediment to selling today, even if it is a slam dunk use case. If the networking team yeah. doesn't buy into it, it's not going to get sold. It's, like, it's almost like they might feel like you're going over their head and they're trying to do an end around. You know? Yeah, and, um, they, and they have the scars to prove you know, why you yeah. don't want to go over their head and do the end around, you know, the, the, yeah. this is all the stuff they've learned over the last 20 plus years as uh, enterprise networkers. Right. Yeah. If yeah. it doesn't integrate, if they can't, if they can't see a path of how I integrate this into like my life cycle management and into my operation centers, it ain't going to happen. You know, they're not going to all of a sudden like dedicate, you know, something new unless like this is the business, like, you know, like the, um, the stadium is a good example of that. Okay. Well, that is the business, you know, but in the general purpose large enterprise where you have like, you know, like you look at GE, they have 10,000 applications. You look at Citigroup, they probably have pretty close to that. You know, you're not going to find the one killer application that's going to kind of all of a sudden disrupt the entire stack, you know. So right. I think that's, you know, a little bit of, a, you know, kind of the disparity. And maybe, Jim, that's where we're kind of coming from. You know, it's like, you know, frankly, I was really bullish and really excited about, I think, the private 5G space because we we're hearing it from um from our board members like oh, okay yeah you know it's like um kind of with eproms you know coming into like uh, laptop devices and you know and into um you know kind of the new iphones and um, android devices they were saying okay well maybe there is like you know uh, a play here but i think you know over the last year like i think you know so they've opened up the doors you know say all right come on in we really want to understand this you know marketplace and i think and i i don't think that they were really kind of wowed you know with the response so maybe you know and i think that they're kind of thinking that no, it, it's probably still too early you know well, for the private 5g i think that's it's, my it's, my take I, well, I one, well, you, unless i'm misreading that you know well no, i think I, I think there's that perception but i do think one area that they're overlooking is um is sort of the neutral host scenario you know because everybody yeah. knows when you when you have a mobile phone and you go into a 
a, a large building, especially get into deep inside a large building, your, you know, your cell phone signal, your, you know, really fades. And, um, you know, the way they've worked around those things to date has been with these distributed antenna systems, right? And, and there's a whole, you know, uh, value chain built around DAS, right? In terms of the way those get sold into buildings these days, but ultimately kind of a private cellular solution is a much better approach in the long run. And it's something that, you know, a whole swath of mainstream enterprises could adopt. I mean, anybody that's in a big skyscraper in a dense urban environment, or even just a large building that could be out in the middle of nowhere, um, having good in-building coverage that's provided in a, in a neutral host fashion. And by that, I mean, that that network can support any, you know, um, cellular user roaming onto that network as if they were on their AT and T and Verizon or or T Mobile network. Um, I think there's a real play there, but again, um, the market's not putting a lot of effort into bringing the enterprise, you know, community along with respect to a neutral host. And I think that's an, another mistake because I think it solves a ton of problems, and it could provide that kind of broad-based adoption of of enterprise five G that I think there's a real need for, and it's just outside, and it's outside of just those select half dozen golden vertical markets. Sorry, Jim. Yeah, no, I, um, you reference a great point. I, I think, um, you know, the future success of Meta and their whole Mokin network setup that they have publicly, you know, stated the building into all of their campuses will, will prove itself valuable in the next few years to come. Stephen, that's a good point. I, I got to say though, guys, because I'm in the trenches and I'm speaking to enterprises, there's, again, the opportunity is there. It's just the way it's positioned. Plus the ecosystem and everything else isn't really caught up yet. Um, we at the Port of Tacoma have now deployed a private network. One of our clients spent a well over $100,000 on access points with very limited coverage uh, in the yard. And now we've got a network that range with better performance latency and all the other fun stuff. So from that standpoint, mind blown. We spoke to a professional services firm that's working with a large retailer and they went and evaluated deploying a cloud hosted um, private 5G solution from one of the big hyperscalers and worked out that it was way more expensive. So they elected to go buy iPhones and then go buy SIM cards from a CSP and that was cheaper long run. Crazy, mm. right? If you think about yeah. it, $50 a month per, per phone and I think they had like a thousand phones or something like that. So it's you see all of this and then we have our hands dirty in a lot of these uh, initiatives and it's it's pretty obvious when you address the economics, when you start to really show the use case potential, lead with that first, then address the economics and then the simplicity of that integrating into someone's IT stack, it, it's it's um, it's easier. It's a much easier conversation. Now, now, that said, there are a lot of enterprises that in, for various reasons don't don't want to work with the telcos uh, they don't want to have them be their managed service providers i don't know why i'm i'm not part of any of that history but we're seeing a lot of that too and that mm. was an opportunity i thought for the csps to really go in and dominate the problem there is that the csps go in some of them not all of them they go in with these solutions they're kind of cost prohibitive because they're kind of building on their blueprint that is their core network blueprint it's way too big for the enterprise and then they also treat it like a black mm. box so really the, the enterprise is paying a high price and all they get at the end of the month is a SIM card that they can essentially put into a device. But in terms of security and some other stuff, there's limited you know, reach that they have into those networks. Yeah. And so that well, maybe this better... all contributes into this, this mismatch that I've been mentioning earlier. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Jim. So like um, uh, one, I think what we're really just saying is that we're, we're seeing, we have different views into the marketplace, right? And I think that's, that's all that we're saying, you know, um, like we see, Kind of the more general purpose large enterprise you know um you're seeing the the places where uh, by definition there's interest you know um and i think you know that's that's you know the, the i think the crux of like you know how we you know are coming to our perceptions uh, or our perceptions sure. are kind of leading us to like you know our uh, opinions so i think you know there's a couple of things that you said that i do want to you know address when i I'm I'm not aware of like you know, uh, and I'm not I'm sure that there is you know, but I'm not aware that uh, there are certain folks in the large enterprise don't that don't want to work with the service providers. And also, we, when we think of CSPs, we think of cloud service providers. <laughs> I think you're thinking of communication service providers, right? Yeah, we usually think of telco, um, or like Verizon, AT and T, you know, uh, T-Mobile, and so forth. 
Uh, and so, and when we think of, you know, the cloud providers, those are cloud CSPs. So I anyway, know I just want to make sure, you know, everyone's yeah, kind that, of familiar. That's like CSP with the, in your world is hyperscaler to me and then telco in your yeah. world is a CSP to me. Yeah, but yes, <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. go with telco and hyperscaler just for, uh, for the sake okay. of clarity today. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm, so I don't see like, you know, the, um, any reluctance there, you know, and I'm sure there is, you know, it's a big marketplace, a lot of people. Um, but I think, you know, for the, for maybe the telcos, um, maybe a better solution for them could be just like what they've always done with like MPLS and with, um, you know, other kind of managed services. And that is they basically take one of your startups um, that have a really good, you know, dashboard that faces the enterprise, abstracts all that stuff, you know, for them. They drop that in, you know, uh, into the enterprise marketplace and then they do the procurement on the service provider side, on the uh, telco side. Um, now, the only problem, you know, with that, I think, is that um, for to have a really good value on that on-prem device, that kind of like, for lack of a better term, gateway or bridge kind of device, um, is that it should support a, a large number of, of uh, telcos. So you can, so the enterprise can arbitrage, you know, and that if they're not kind of locked into like one, you know, and uh, obviously that you can do a five-year kind of service agreement and you get volume discounts and, and all that stuff that could be done to, for the telcos to try to mitigate competition and buy, sell loyalty and, and so forth. Um, all that could be in play, but I think that is the key piece that's kind of missing here is that maybe it's the telcos that are um, the kind of the, the, the channel uh, into the enterprise since they do have reach there and, um, and they utilize like some of the startups and others that are innovative and that understand the, the enterprise marketplace um, really well and um, can provide that uh, service for them. Yeah, you know, there, there's a different definition of what private 5G is, uh, depending on whoever you talk to in the telco industry. Uh, and I won't name names, but private 5G ranges from a network slice being masqueraded as a private 5G network uh, to on, on one spectrum to another spectrum, which is a fully managed, as you say, Nick, uh, built, deployed, designed by the CSP and managed using their license spectrum. Uh, to the enterprise and then there's a lot of initiations between that as well like um some people are calling, calling private 5g license spectrum that someone can go in and basically license from a csp and they're calling those private networks yeah and I yeah think, there's I think... a lot of slight yeah so enterprise cellular is going to be real that there's no question in my mind it's just what's the final yeah. you know solution and i don't i don't know if it'll be one i think it'll be yeah well i think that's that, that's the point i wanted to make i mean i wrote a blog last year about this i think one of the challenges in private 5g is one size does not fit all you know that's totally. one of the benefits of wi-fi you know despite the fact that there's multiple vendors and they all sell different products with different features you know at a high level if you squint your eyes it all looks like it's the same thing you know you put the wi-fi access points all over your building and you got coverage it's not as simple as that with private 5G because you could be doing it, you know, you could be doing it in building in a carpeted environment. You could be doing it on a manufacturing floor. You could be doing it in a large warehouse. You could be doing it over a large scale, you know, outdoor campus environment. You've got different types of, you know, radios you may de be deploying and different frequency um, bands. Um, how you operate that network in terms of what is on prem and what might be based in the cloud could be different. So there's a lot of moving parts. And I think that's one of the reasons it's hard to converge on, you know, a standard kind of repeatable design pattern for how to deploy a 5G network. Um, really what there probably will be is, you know, three or four, maybe even five different repeatable design patterns, depending on the, you know, the operational environment you're targeting. And I think, sure. you know, we're just not there yet, which is why I think Nick, you're saying, you know, folks like the, the big operators can come in and kind of play a lead role here, pulling this together. But I mean, all the big system integrators are trying to play that role as well. And yeah. even, even some just large equipment vendors and large cloud service providers are trying to play that role. So there's a whole bunch of folks trying to get involved in kind of leading the charge there. I think over time, the market will settle down and probably for specific, you know, use case scenarios, there'll be sort of a, a traditional kind of lead player that will step up. 
um, but it may not be the same player for all the different use cases and scenarios. You know, it's just going to depend, I think, on the, on how this plays out. So we're so early in the market, it's really hard to make these predictions. But it, it's very helpful for people to be aware that this is going on, though. That's why it hasn't just settled down to kind of an easy, repeatable buying decision for enterprise uh, buyers. Yeah, and I think the clock is ticking, frankly. <laughs> You know, um, like they don't have infinite amount of time to get their act together and get the ecosystem like straightened out, you know, for this marketplace. Um, the Wi-Fi market is not standing still, you know, and also we have low orbit satellite. You know, the the intro, you know, the the announcement what last month, you know, with T-Mobile and with uh, Starlink, you know, okay, great. Now you can text, you know, from your mobile device there, but like that's just the beginning. And um, you know, if you look at any of Elon's companies, the, they're kind of innovation machines. So it's like, you know, it'll be interesting. There's, you know, to me, there's there's a horse race that's on and I haven't, you know, and I haven't seen the 5G um, community really focus on the large enterprise other than those couple of verticals where where there's immediate, they can talk to the use case and they can, you know, it's, you know, it's sell into those markets, whether those are warehouses or stadiums or, you know, you know, hospitals or what have you, um, manufacturing, some manufacturing sites and so forth. But I think that's, I think there's, you know, again, they don't think they don't have an infinite amount of time here, you know, so. I, I spoke to a VP of IT who called a, a telco here in the United States to, start a conversation around a private 5g solution and the carrier's response or the telco's response was, yeah, give me a call in eight months. And so <laughs> that's, that's not a, that's not a single of a signal rather of, of what, you know, that, that the market is, but it's an example where to your point, Nick, the market is moving forward. It may, it may be moving at a glacier speed, but it is moving forward. What blows my mind is everyone had this big belief that 5g was going to be transformative for the carriers. And it is, and it's going to be yeah. in the enterprise, but they all kind of stuck their laurels to the consumer space. And now we're three and a half years yeah. or four years of this journey. That's not paying off. It will not pay off in 6G. <clears throat> I've had three 5G phones myself. I'm telling you, my life has not changed. I'm not willing to spend more for bandwidth. And I think <sighs> I represent most consumers out there. So it is the enterprise space. And the, and the yeah. enterprises will spend 4.5 or $4.6 trillion a year on IT, which is encompassing of yeah. all connectivity, communications, cloud services, professional services, all that stuff, according to Gartner, right? That's yeah. almost three times as much as what all the carriers generate in, you know, a year, all of them globally connecting billions yeah. of subscribers. So th that is a, that is a skill set in many cases that the carriers are learning and it's bigger guys. It's bigger than just connectivity and MPLS circuits and SD WAN and private 5G. It's really solutions oriented. And this is yeah. where the carriers are, sort of flat footed because they don't understand that they've never really been surrounded by an ecosystem, which is why we built the lab where it's to create a software ecosystem mm. around the promise and capabilities of, of edge and connectivity and everything else. And, and this is again, going back to my, my story from my time at Microsoft, we had, we understood the enterprise IT world at Microsoft. They still very much do today. They sold it through windows server and exchange server and SharePoint and all these on-prem products. And then they moved to the cloud thinking, well, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, all this stuff that you've enjoyed on premise is now in the cloud and it's managed, come over to the cloud. It didn't work out. And so Microsoft had to go back mm -hmm. and think about how do we bring the cloud value as part of bigger solutions and invest in that. And look where Microsoft yeah. is today, right? A, a multi-trillion yeah. valued company because they they took that uh, that, that approach. And this is where I, I, I tried to- Well, they had the pandemic. <laughs> the pandemic they, they helped did. them a lot. They, they you know. did, and, and AI is helping yep. quite a bit now too, right? With Copilot and their collaboration with OpenAI and all the other fun stuff. Yeah. So, but yeah, this is where I'm trying to tell the like telco. Huge. The telco industry should not be limiting itself to just the pipe. Um, there's lots of value in it, yes, but man, there's this broadening ecosystem around the use of that pipe that are solutions that they should be involved in because that that will ultimately pull them through. I see them as a platform, no different than I see the hyperscalers as platforms as well. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Jim, I, I, I'm sorry, Junik. I, I, what always struck me about 5G is if you kind of really dig into, you know, let's say what the GSMA is saying to promote 5G, it's literally all about enterprise. I mean, well, you know, yeah, in terms of the use thing. cases, you know, they have that yeah. triangle with uh, Hans Mobile Broadband, URLLC, and MMMTC, which is the massive uh, IoT stuff. And then you look at all the different use cases. 
there are some consumer use cases in there, but the vast majority of them are all targeted at the enterprise market. Yet, when they finally went to deploy 5G, they put 5G radios up on a, 4, a 4G LTE core and then sold that to consumers. Um, I don't even have a 5G phone yet because, you know, oh, where I live, I don't really have 5G coverage. You know, there aren't 5G towers it, yeah. around here. I'm like, well, you know, so and I'm, I know I'm not missing anything yet. So, you know, th there's a little bit of a, I think, a strategic error there in terms of how, you know, they took this approach to 5G that didn't really shake the world to its foundations. And now we know that, you know, there's a whole whole lot of really great, you know, kind of application enabling technology there in the future, but we're not there yet. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of, you know, and I think, Jim, I mean, uh, Nick, to your point, you know, the clock is ticking. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think my take on this is, you know, anytime you go to market with a new technology, you got to be really clear on your market focus, who your target market is, and, and make sure you're delivering the right products and solutions to, you know, make them successful in whatever it is they're trying to do. And, I kind of kind of feel like with the whole 5G thing, the industry at large kind of, you know, missed the mark, you know, and now we're in a kind of a, you know, kind of a catch up mode here. And and private 5G, you know, is, is one of in my in my view is kind of one of the, the bright lights here in the 5G marketplace today. Um, but again, even there, there's a fair degree, fair degree of complexity and, you know, a lot of different solutions out there. Um, and, you know, that's that's a lot for the, you know, the enterprise IT professional to kind of digest, right? That's just a lot for them to digest. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like, it's really, it's, it's such a shame, you know, cause Jim, you have the innovation lab, you know, and you're trying to like help facilitate, um, you know, a, awareness and proof of concepts and uh, demonstrate the art of the possible, you know, um, you know, we have uh, the large consumer marketplace, you know, uh, within ONU. Um, and so you would think like together, uh, that we would, that there would be kind of a open, warm welcome, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> and I think no. that's like, huh? <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, the telcos, um, they're not they're not necessarily plumbed for this ecosystem approach, and and that that is not a, yeah. a criticism or a knock or anything. It's just part of the progression, right? But. Um, yeah, you know, like if if you're a developer today and you you want to go build a Hello World app, uh, regardless of your hyperscale, here, you drop your credit card, you're up and running in minutes, right? And you're touching billions of people around the world today. If you try to sell a solution through a carrier, you're guaranteed six to twelve months before your solution is fully activated. So the 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 speed at which they operate is so far different. And again, that's not a criticism; it's just more. You know, you bring this to light. We've worked with 129 teams from around the world. These these teams, are Jim, it's a criticism. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's more of a it's a self reflection, right? Like when Microsoft yeah. said, "Hey, we're going to take Windows Server." I'm, I'm sorry to go back to Microsoft, it's, but but it's my experiences, right? And it's, yeah. it was the inspiration okay. behind why I built the lab. But we, hmm. we took Windows Server at Microsoft and said, "Okay, now we're calling it Azure," and just expected there to be floodgates of demand. It doesn't work like that, right? You you truly yeah. have to build an ecosystem uh, around this, and and that's exactly what you know, we did here was to bring more of that value to to the promise of work connectivity. And we even talked about edge computing where that's going as well all in the context of supporting the enterprise. Yeah. I think the other thing too, is that, you know, um, like, you know, you look at like, you know, the tele the, the telecom, you know, providers, you know, it's like they spent a ton of money on spectrum. Um, they're now competing with, uh, the CSPs, the cloud service providers, who understand the applications in that ecosystem. Um, and so um, they focused on the consumer. And the consumer, like you, is kind of an archetype of like, you know, about, you know, 300 million others, you know, and that is that it's, it's hard to kind of get them to spend more money on bandwidth and to see how that um, 5G is going to like, you know, add more value to them. So you would think that they would be like all over the enterprise marketplace, you know, and you're right. The, the large enterprise is about a $5 trillion spend, you know? And so um, I'm not sure what they're waiting for. I really don't, you know? Um, well, Nick, I think, yeah. I think one of the issues is, like I said, the, the full realization of 5G, you know, happens when they really start delivering these services off of a, 
5G standalone you know, cloud native core because that's going to be engineered from the ground up. To no, be I think they need a crisis, platform. Steve. Steve, they need a crisis to really wake them up to this marketplace. You know, um, it's like uh, either stock market crashes, you know, on them, their valuations like crash on them. The CSPs start to take a lot of market share, you know, from them. And then all of that kind of um, kind of architectural underpinnings that you were talking about would be accelerated. Um, you know, but I think that they really need, you know, they they haven't, it seems to me that they really haven't kind of grasped the moment, you know, and um, and like I said, I'm not sure what they're waiting for. Um, maybe they have to, maybe they're, they're so large and they're so process oriented and um, that they are, they need a big crisis to wake them up. But that's the only thing I can think of, you know? I, I don't think that's unfair, actually. I think that's actually a valid point because, you know, anytime you have a new technology initiative, you know, you can always choose to accelerate it. And by the way, all that cloud native core stuff, it's not, it's new technology for the mobile core, but none of it's new technology. It's all the same stuff that the cloud providers have been doing for 10 years and that the enterprise, you know, market's already adopting. So you could actually, you know, kick that into a, into a higher gear if you, if you, if you chose to do that. And it is happening. It's not like there aren't 5G, you know, standalone cores out there in the world, but there's fewer of them out there than I think was envisioned, say, if you look back like five years ago. So, yeah, the question mm -hmm. I guess you're raising is, you know, what's going to provide that impetus? And you do get into this chicken and egg stuff too, because if you're waiting for all these uh, enterprise um, um, IT folks to be paying more for all these 5G services that you're planning to deliver, um, but you don't have the platform to deliver those on, you are stuck in this chicken and egg uh, mode, which, <laughs> you know, you need to kind of yeah. get out of. Oh, yeah. I, I, um, just to add to your thoughts there, Nick, there was, when I started the lab, there was a ton of hype. Stephen, you and I chatted a couple of years after I started the lab, but there was just a ton of hype and promise of what 5G would mean for the carriers, right? And so most all of them mm -hmm. went all in and in many cases doing the 5G RAN swaps and then eventually getting to standalone. And that's added considerable debt. And they're still paying, they, most of them were still paying for their 4G LTE capital debt as well, mm -hmm. right? And I just yeah. did a, a quick co-pilot search and I, I just compared Microsoft and Verizon. Verizon holds about $129 billion worth of debt. Verizon, right? And so they're primarily a U.S. company serving primarily the U.S. market. They do have some assets that they uh, in business that they do abroad in, in Europe as well, but they're primarily U.S. Uh, when you compare that to Microsoft's debt, Microsoft's debt on the high end is about, what is it here, $72 billion? Yeah, and they can pay Microsoft, that down. Right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, they have 130 billion in cash reserves. So yeah. there is a crisis. And a three trillion dollar right market cap. Yeah. Right. So do you want to continue yeah. monetizing ARPU at whatever it is, forty, fifty dollars a sim, or do you want to start playing in the consumption world, uh, where you yeah. know that that variability of demand and in the enterprise is you know long term is lucrative with the right solutions, and most all yeah. of them don't want to be dumb pipes in the they and they saw what happened in four GLT and so they wanted to use five G as a way to change course on just being a dump pipe and all this value going on top of their networks. Well, we're four yeah. years into this journey. I think they're still kind of there. Right. And, and the only way you get yeah. away from that is you have to, you have to eventually evolve yourself from just being a communications provider to a true platform and a platform, yeah. whether it's in 5g private 5g or an edge is essentially, um, you know, the, the way forward. That's where you start to create value via your platform and then have others build on your platform and be successful. And they're all nervous about where the hyperscalers are. Well, the hyperscalers are a platform. That's what they are. You could do literally anything yeah. you want on a hyperscaler cloud. You can't really today yeah. on a, on a telco. Now, Kamara has some, the project Kamara effort between GSMA <laughs> and Linux foundation has some promise, you know, setting up some mm -hmm. APIs, but you want to look at that cynically. This is just the carrier's attempts or telco's attempts to do, what Twilio has done for 10 plus years. Yeah. On a cloud based yeah. platform. On a, on a cloud based platform. Right. So. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's, um, you know, it's it, it, really, if I was in the telco, if I was like in the kind of CEO on the board, of the telco, I, my God, I'd be freaking like, you know, <laughs> I'd have the shoe banging on the desk, you know, <laughs> it's like, dude, man, are you kidding me? It's like, like the, the, the hyperscalers or the cloud service providers, they own the developers. They can tell they can talk that story of the use case. Um, you know, it's like it's going to be hard for the um, telcos to, kind of, I think, tell that story, um, you know, there because there is a 
kind of a credibility gap, you know, um, there. Uh, also, I, I don't, I haven't pulled up the numbers as of late, but like this, the CSPs have also spent a ton of money on Spectrum and also on network infrastructure, you know, as well. So if there's anyone who can really kind of tell that story, it's the cloud service providers. What's going for the telecom providers is that the CSPs have too much opportunity to focus on this one aspect. I think yeah. that's it. They, you know, there are yep. too many bigger markets that they're focused on, and that is their window. That is the telco's window of, of opportunity. They're yeah. all chasing the AI, you know, uh, marketplace, and um, you know, and the, the telcos. Hey, you know, you have this five G moment of opportunity. Yeah, and telecom networks are, are capital it? intensive, right? You're building out the underlying fiber optic transport for these networks. You know, you've got all the fixed line broadband access build out that's going on with fiber to buildings and homes. And then you've got the, the wireless build out. So it's very capital intensive. Um, but, you know, if you kind of just operate at that layer, then, you know, really what you're selling is bit carriage, right? Um, and, and you're not yeah. really, you're not really serving as a real platform. And I think 5G gives the the operators a chance to serve as a as a as a platform as opposed to just a you know a, another mode of of connectivity so yeah. imagine imagine a world guys where you had a, a telco that had some edge computing capabilities and was able to expose that to a bunch of developers building gen ai based use cases right whether it's a co-pilot assistant type use case or uh, an ai capability for an autonomous anything imagine the platform opportunities that they would have and yeah, the yeah. net new revenue that they would be exposing to on already sunk cost in capex yeah imagine that you don't have to really mm. imagine it here's my bigger yeah. concern is we we chatted a lot about this impedance smitch match and timing challenges with private 5g but i hope you guys agree with me that cellular is going to play a role in the it stack at some point how oh, yeah. big or what oh, have yeah. you it's going to it's going to play a role now when the industrial complex of the us gdp starts to adopt cellular in big ways the CBRS stuff that we're doing today is nice. It's a nice little seating, but eventually mm -hmm. you're going to get more and more enterprises that have massive capexes. Going to, they're going to go to the FCC and ask for more spectrum. Right. That's going to put a pressure on the the license spectrum that we have today at some right. point. That's already so happening, what, right? It's so happening. if you play this thing forward, are you going to hold back the industrial complex of the United States because of license spectrum, or are you going to start to look for freeing some more of that up because it will become an, almost a necessity in the enterprise longer term? That's yeah. my concern. Mm -hmm. Right. And so yeah. if um, if any of the hyperscalers show up to an FCC auction and start bidding on Spectrum, it's lights out. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I, they have yeah. nearly limited less uh, funding. They can go and outbid any carrier. Yeah, I, yeah. And I think to be clear, folks who are listening here, I mean, in my mind, it's not a question of if when it comes to 5G, it is the next generation of mobile technology. It's not like Wi-Fi can do what 5G does. You know, Wi-Fi within an in-building environment has some strengths, but you know, has get outside of a building environment. You know, 5G was built for mobile network connectivity. It's well engineered. When you get to like release 18, there's all kinds of really you know advanced capabilities that are being built into you know the network infrastructure. So it's not a question of if with 5G. However, it is a question of who's going to really capitalize on this opportunity. That's true. Right? And what's Cellular that ecosystem a, yeah. going to look like? Who's really going to be driving the bus on this for, and specifically for the enterprise market? Let's set the consumer yeah. market aside. I, I agree. And the only yeah. thing I would add to that, Stephen, is it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's five G or six G right. or seven G. Um, it's yeah. just cellular. Totally agree. Right? Yeah. Right. And 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 that's that's how enterprises that I've spoken to again limited sample size, but that's how they're thinking about it. They know cellular is going to play a role in their IT stack. It's yeah. a matter of time. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, it's, it, I know we've kind of, we really haven't brought in the conversation of low orbit satellite and also, and, you know, and kind of the progression of Wi-Fi into this conversation as well, but it's really, it's all of these kind of mobile cellular wireless, you know, kind of technologies um, that will no doubt play a role. Um, the question is like how big of a role and um i'm um, frankly i'm um, you know i know we've been beating up on the telcos you know and that was not the agenda for us to do <laughs> in this you know uh, but i think we're all a little frustrated you know with them that there's a great opportunity for them and um and they're not able to kind of like um see clear to kind of um seize it i think that's maybe a little yeah. bit of the frustration and i'll tell you they don't get 
and, and they, they got the Rodney Dangerfield, you know, um, you know, uh, label. They don't get much respect, you know, and I think, th you know, this is kind of why, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, un it's unfortunate, you know, because like, if you think about during the pandemic, really, I think who saved the economy were the telecos, um, like the cloud service providers got all the credit, but it was, uh, but it was that, 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 bandwidth infrastructure that we had and their ability to scale that up in a real short amount of time that allowed the economy to keep operating with remote workforce. And they got no credit for that, like zero credit for it. And, um, and that's too bad. They should have, um, but you know, like Microsoft got the credit and, you know, and, uh, Amazon and Google and yeah, the you know, broadband and, infrastructure I mean, held up, you know, the internet backbone didn't blow up. There was enough bandwidth, you know, connected into people's homes that you could do work from home. So I think it was a real success story in terms of, you know, pipe level connectivity, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. This yeah. gentleman is, is why I started the lab, because I have so much passion for the opportunity that the telcos have in front of them. I ran yeah. into the fire. I didn't run away from the fire. And yeah. I certainly yeah. don't want to come across critical because I'm not. I, I'm, right. I'm in the game with oh. these guys and I see right. this opportunity. I'm just trying to help bring a software context to this opportunity not a pipe context because you're, you're really good on pipes, but it's commoditized today. Hmm. Right. And we're seeing this yeah. in consumer every single day. So it's this classic blue ocean versus red ocean, right? The red ocean is sharks going after each other, trying to oh. fight for what what's left in market share versus blue ocean. As you take your same product and you're bringing it into another market with some different right. value. And all of a sudden you're setting up yourself a new market. Right. Right. And this is why I, you know, I, I feel very strongly about the opportunity for telcos. They, but they have to think differently about what they bring in terms of value to the marketplace. It can't just be about uh, connectivity, right? There's so much more up the stack that they can be part of, um, but, yeah. but it requires different thinking, right? Just just as yeah. it did at, at my time at Microsoft. We we knew IT very well. We brought the cloud and we were thinking this is panacea. It's going to solve all world problems. No, it didn't work out like that. And this is Microsoft, right? It, you had to put effort in. You have to change, fundamentally change the business to support Yeah, it. and I think that's, and that's, you know, that's, that's a big kind of like turn the Queen Mary around the Hudson River kind of problem, right? You know, it's like, it's tough because it's not just new thinking because you can think differently and you can hire people who do that. But there's like all this entrenched process and the skill sets, you know, oh, and totally. these revenue and, and streams it, it, and that. It gets, you know. it gets pointed out to me, Nick, often that, you know, that don't forget, Jim, that telcos were regulated up to like 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And many of them still have a regulation sort of mindset in yeah, and so from an you know from a governmental standpoint, I I do think here in the United States we're we're pouring I just read this morning millions into ORAN research, um, you know because the government wants to you know get ahead of where some of the standards mm -hmm. have been set already by by China. Um, I I think you know the, the more the government could do to help move them past the regulations space and really push them into the free market uh, space, I think I think you might see a lot of that innovation really come to light. Uh, but you yeah. can't you can't expect the carriers, the telcos, to to be bigger, better, more platform oriented, but then regulate them in terms of their pricing and all these other things that have are legacy from you know years gone by. And so there's that tension yeah. too that unfortunately the telcos have are hem, are uh, hampered by that the cloud providers aren't. And you know I think the two actually work really well together. Not a big yeah. difference in this rivalry between them, but yeah. Well, regulation can be kind of the death of innovation, um, but not all, you know, you have the banking industry is highly regulated, you know, it's like they tend to innovate pretty well. And, and, um, and so does like um, clearly pharma, you know, and also healthcare, yeah. um, you know, and so it, it doesn't, you know, like, like regulation doesn't eat innovation for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, you can still innovate there. But, Absolutely. One thing we didn't chat about is these private networks, they're not carrier networks in the sense of their data and IMS networks. These are right. almost always all data networks. Right. So that's to your yeah, point, right. Nick, that's, oh, that's not true, a regulated yeah. space at all. Right. Right. Yeah. These are just data networks at this point. If someone needs, you know, voice, there's plenty of teams that are, that are doing IMS. We're working with a few of them ourselves. Um, but these are primarily data networks, which means no holds barred at this point. Right. right? You're just yeah. going in with a data layer. Well, and a lot of yeah. the, even the wide area, applications, the killer applications for 5G or data applications, you know, whether All it's self-driving cars or smart cities or virtual reality or AR, um, you know, um, headsets and things like that. And, you know, the funny thing is, and I keep going back to this chicken and egg thing, but, you know, 
look, I mean, Apple just announced their headset, right? Their, their AR headset, very pricey kind of first generation product. But there's no doubt that product's going to find its way into enterprise use cases, right? There's no doubt. And and some of those will be on-prem where you can hook that thing to Wi-Fi, but some of them are going to be out in the field where you really want to hook it to a cellular network with the right you know, throughput and the right latency and, um, and the right level of reliability. And, you know, to me, you know, that 5G market's caught a little flat-footed right now in terms of the, that mm-hmm. device exists, it's available. Five grand is not a lot of money for a big company that could equip like a field tech with that or something like that, right? For really high-end kind of applications. And, um, you know, can the, can the network really support that device today? It'd be interesting, you know, to see how that plays out. So you can't just sit around and wait for the market to come to you, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, the most successful um, businesses, you know, understand yeah. that, right? They go make the market happen. They don't sit and wait for it to come to them. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, I think you know, we're, this is probably a good time to like, you know, cut down, but I think we should do one round of what are the two things that we think that, would really help promote uh, the 5G marketplace, private 5G marketplace. Um, that's kind of like what we've been talking about. Um, who wants to go first? Like, um, yeah, I'll go. Right, I'll, I'll, take, I'll go. Okay. okay. All right. Good. No. Yeah, I mean, I, are, I think one thing that that could be done is I think there should be a whole lot more talk about neutral host because neutral okay. host has immediate benefit for the enterprise that, that puts up the neutral host network and for the folks that actually use that network. So it's a kind of a win-win. It's not like you're trying to ram it down someone's throat who doesn't want it. Everybody knows when they go into a building, you lose cellular coverage and it's really frustrating. And telling people to go on the Wi-Fi network is not the right answer, right? But if I could just roam freely in with my Verizon phone onto an in-building neutral host network, um, you know, it's a win for me. It's a win for the folks that put up that network. And it drives a whole lot of volume for the private 5G network market in terms of equipment, a lot of volume. So to me, that's the number one thing. And I'm just surprised that the the big operators are not on the neutral host bandwagon. Okay. Number two. Go to someone else. Cause I don't know what my number two is yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim. Uh, I two? think it's a combination. Yeah. Simplicity of, of, of network adoption and uh, operations, but also integration into existing IT stacks, I think are are paramount for adoption longer term. And then apps or use cases. Those are the two big ones. Without those two, yeah. um, I don't see the market really taking off. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have two. Um, so um, first of all, um, take that marketing budget that you use for consumer 5G and apply it all towards the enterprise marketplace. Um, mm-hmm. Second is that before you do that, is uh, make sure that you can deliver on a range of general purpose kind of enterprise grade 5G solutions and market the heck out of it and deliver on that value that the brand is espousing. So I think those are my two. Yeah, my okay. second one is... is ah, you, you got a second one now. Yeah, I do, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think if you're selling private 5G, um, essentially on the supplier side, you know, whether it's software or hardware, you know, you really need to think about how you're selling to the enterprise networking folks, because that's really your customer. It, and, I, mm. and it goes counter to, I think the prevailing wisdom is no, no, it's the line of business guy and the OT side of the business in the, in the manufacturing operation. He's really my customer. But the answer I think is, yeah, in the short run, he looks like your customer, but in the long run, he's not your customer because in the long run, the networking folks will be running that network. They're not going to let the manufacturing people run the network. It's just not how it works. So um, they need to understand who their customer is in the long run, and they need to start selling to that customer, and they're not doing that today. Okay. Awesome. Jim, I'm not sure if this is what you expected, you know, coming on board, you know, (laughs) but it was really nice to have you, and, you know, it was a really great lively discussion you know um steve thanks so much for kind of pulling this whole thing together you know and getting us getting this topic on the agenda as well um i think that's all we got uh everyone out there thanks so much for plugging in and listening and uh we'll talk to you all soon thank you everyone thank you guys thank you Cheers.